where the red fern grows, day three. With a pup under each arm, running it and running as fast as I could, I lit out for the house. Coming out of the bottoms into a fresh plowed field, I set my pups down so I could get a little more speed. I started yelling as soon as I came inside of the house. Mama came flying out with my sisters right behind her. <coughs> Papa was out by the barn harnessing his team. Mama yelled something to him about a snake. He dropped the harness, jumped over the rail fence, and then a lope, long lope started for me. Mama reached me first. She grabbed me and shouted, Where did it bite you? Bite me, I said. Why, Mama, I'm not bit. I've got him, Mama. I've got him. Got what? Mama asked. A big coon, I said. The biggest one in the river bottoms. He is this big, Mama. I made a circle with my arms as big as a 20-gallon keg. Mama just groaned way down deep and covered her face with her hands. Some big tears squeezed out between her fingers. Almost in a whisper, I heard her say, Thank God, I thought you were snake bitten. My sister, seeing Mama crying, puckered up and started bawling. He needs a whipping, the oldest one said. That's what he needs, scaring Mama that way. Something busted loose inside me and I cried a little too. I didn't mean to scare Mama, I sniffed. I just wanted everyone to know I caught a coon. Up until this time, Papa hadn't said a word. He just stood looking on. Here now, he said. Let's have none of this crying. He didn't mean to scare anyone. Taking his handkerchief from his pocket, he stepped over to Mama, put his arm around her, and st started drying her eyes. Mama poked her head around him and glared at me. Billy Coleman, she shouted, if you ever scare me like that again, I'll take a switch and wear you to a frazzle. This hurt my feelings, and I really did get turned up. Everybody's mad at me, I said, and I haven't done anything but catch the biggest coon on the river. Mama came over. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't mean to be cross, but you did scare me. I thought a rattlesnake had bitten you. Now that's... That's all settled, Papa said. We had better go get that coon. Looking at Mama, he said, Why don't you and the girls go with us? I don't think it'll take long. Mama looked at me, smiled, and turned to the girls. Would you like to go? She asked. Their only answer was a lot of squealing and jumping up and down. On the way, Mama noticed some blood on my shirt. She stopped me and started looking me over. Where did that come from? She asked. Did that coon bite you? No, Mama, I said. I didn't get close enough for him to bite me. With a worried look on her face, she jerked out my shirt. You don't seem to be scratched anywhere, she said. Maybe this is where it came from, Papa said. He reached down and picked up my boy pup. His little black nose was split wide open and was bleeding. I saw a relieved look come over Mama's face. Looking at me, she started shaking her head. I don't know, she said. I just don't know. Did that coon get a hold of this pup? Papa asked. He sure did, Papa, I said. But it wasn't the coon coon's fault. If it hadn't been for little Ann, he'd have eaten him up. I told how my dogs had tied into the coon. Papa laughed as he fondled my pup. This dog is going to be a good coon hound, he said, and I mean a good one. The coon started squalling as soon as we came in sight. My goodness, Mama said, you wouldn't think anything so small would be so vicious. Papa picked up a club. Now everybody stand back out of the way, he said. This won't take long. My pups were wanting to get to the coon so badly that they were hard to hold. I had to squeeze them up tight to keep them from jumping right out of my arms. My sisters, with eyes as big as blue marbles, got behind Mama and peeked around her. Papa whacked the coon a good one across the head. He let out a loud squall, growled, and showed his teeth. He tried hard to get to Papa, but the trap held him. The girls buried their faces in Mama's dress and started bawling. Mama turned her back on the fight. I heard her say, I wish we hadn't come, poor thing. Papa whacked him again, and it was all over. It was too much for Mama and the girls. They left. I heard the tall cane rattling as they ran for the house. After the coon was killed, I walked over. Papa was trying to get the coon's paw from the trap. He couldn't do it. Taking a pair of pliers from his pocket, he said, It's a good thing I had these along, or we would have had to cut his foot off. After Pa had pulled the nails, he lifted the coon's paw from the hole. There, clamped firmly in it, was the bright piece of tin. In a low voice, Papa said, Well, I'll be darned. All he had to do was open it up, and he was free, but he wouldn't do it. Your grandfather was right. A sorrowful look came over Papa's face as he ran his fingers through the soft, yellow hair. Billy, he said, I want you to take a hammer and pull the nails from every one of those traps. It's summertime now, and their fur isn't any good. Besides, I don't think this is very sportsmanlike. The coon doesn't have a chance. It's all right this time. You needed this one. But from now on, I want you to catch them with your dogs. That way, they have a 50-50 chance. I will, Papa, I said. That's what I t intended to do. While we were skinning the coon, Papa asked me when I was going to start training my dogs. I don't know, I said. Do you think they're too young? No, I don't think so, he said. I've heard that the younger they are, the better it is. Well, in that case, I said, I'll start tomorrow. With the help of my oldest sister, we started giving my pups their first lessons. She would hold their collars while I made trails with the hide for them to follow. I'd climb trees that leaned out over the river, jump out into the water, swim to the other side, and make trails up and down the bank. With a long pole and wire, I'd drag the hide on top of rail fences, swing it through the air, and let it touch the ground 20 or 30 feet away. 
I did everything with that hide a coon would do, and probably a lot of things a coon couldn't do. It was a beautiful sight to see my pups work those trails. At first they were awkward and didn't know what to do, but they would never quit trying. Old Dan would get so eager and excited he would overrun a trail. Where it twisted or turned, he would run straight on, balling up a storm. It didn't take him long to realize that a smart old coon didn't always run in a straight line. Little Ann never overran a trail. She would wiggle and twist, cry and whine, and pretty soon she would figure it out. At first they were afraid of water. I never would admit it even to myself. I always said that they just didn't like to get wet. They would follow the trail to the stream and stop. Sitting down on their rears, they would cry and beg for help. With a pup under each arm, I had wade out into the stream and set them down in the cool water. Nine times out of ten, one pup would swim one way and the other one would just go the opposite way. I had a time with this part of their training, but my persistence had no bounds. It wasn't long until they loved the water. Old Dan would jump as far out as he could and practically knock the river dry. Little Ann would ease herself in and swim like a muskrat for the opposite shore. I taught, I taught my dogs every trick I knew and any new ones I heard about. I taught them how to split up on a riverbank to search for the hidden trail because it was impossible to tell where a coon would come out of the rip of the water. Sometimes he might swim downstream and other times he might swim upstream. Maybe he'd come back to the bank he had just left or he would cross over to the other side. Perhaps he would stop in the middle of the stream on an old drift. Sometimes he would come out of the water by catching the dangling limbs of a leaning tree birch and climbing up never touching the bank. Or he could get out on the same trail he used to go in and backtrack. He would sometimes crawl up under an un <coughs> undermined bank or into an old muskrat den. One of the favorite tricks of a smart old ringtail is the tree barking trick. This he accomplished by running far up on the side of a tree and using his stout legs for leverage, springing 20 or 30 feet away before touching the ground. Dumb hounds trail up to the tree and start bawling treed. I taught my dogs to circle for a good hundred yards to be sure he was still in the tree before bawling. In order to learn more about coon hunting, I'd hang around my grandfather's store and listen to the stories told by the coon hunters. Some of the tales I heard were long and tall, but I believed them all. I could always tell when Grandpa was ki kidding me by the twinkle in his eyes. He told how a coon could climb right up the fog and disappear in the stars, and how he could leap on a horse's back and run him over, run him over your dogs. I didn't care, for I loved to hear the tall tales. Anything that had a coon hair in it, I believed completely. All through that summer and into the late fall, the train... The training went on. Although I was worn down to a frazzle, I was a happy boy. I figured I was ready for the ringtails. Late one evening, tired and exhausted, I sat down by a big sycamore and called my dogs to me. It's all over, I said. There'll be no more lessons. I've worked hard and I've done my best. From now on, it's all up to you. Hunting season is just a few days away and I'm going to let you rest for I want you to be in good shape the night it opens. It was wonderful indeed how I could have heart-to-heart -heart talks with my dogs, and they always seemed to understand. Each question I asked was answered in their own doggish way. Although they couldn't talk in my terms, they had a language of their own that was easy to understand. Sometimes I would see the answer in their eyes, and again it would be in the friendly wag wagging of their tails. Other times I could hear the answer in a low whine, or feel it in the soft caress of a warm, flicking tongue. In some way, they would always answer. Chapter 8 the day hunting season opened, I was as nervous as S Sammy, our house cat. Part of that seemingly endless day was spent getting things ready for the coming night. I cleaned my lantern and filled it full of oil. With hog lard, I greased my boots until they were as soft as a hummingbird's nest. I was grinding my axe when Papa came around. He smiled as he said, This is the big night, isn't it? Sure is, Papa, I said, and I've waited a long time for it. Yes, I know, he said. I've been thinking. There's not too much to do around here during the hunting season. I'm pretty sure I can take care of things, so you can just go ahead and hunt all you want. Thanks, Papa, I said. I guess I'll be out pretty late at night. I'll probably have to do a lot of sleeping in the daytime. Papa started frowning. You know, he said, your mother doesn't like this hunting of yours very much. She's worried about you being out all by yourself. I can't see why Mama has to worry, I said. Haven't I been roaming the woods ever since I was big enough to walk, and I'm almost 14 now? I know, said Papa. It's all right with me, but women are a little different than men. They worry more. Now, just to be on the safe side, I think it would be a good idea for you to tell us where you'll be hunting. Then, if anything happens, we'll know where to look. I told him I would, but I didn't think anything was going to happen. After Papa had left, I started thinking. He doesn't even talk to me like I was a boy anymore. He talks to me like I was a man. These wonderful thoughts made me feel just about as big as our old red mule. 
I had a good talk with my dogs. I've waited almost three years for this night, I said, and it hasn't been easy. I've taught you everything I know, and I want you to do your best. Little Anne acted like she understood. She whined and saved me a wash job on my face. Old Dan may have, but he didn't act like it. He just lay there in the sunshine, all stretched out and limber as a rag. During supper, Mama asked me where I was going to hunt. I'm not going far, I said, just down on the river. I could tell Mama was worried and didn't make me feel too good. Billy, she said, I don't approve of this hunting, but it looks like I can't say no, not after all you've been through, getting your dogs and all that training. Ah, oh, he'll be all right, Papa said. Besides, he's getting to be a good-sized man now. Man, Mama explained, or exclaimed, why, he's still just a little boy. You can't keep him a little boy always, Papa said. He's got to grow up someday. I know, Mama said, but I don't like it, not at all, and I can't help worrying. Mama, please don't worry about me, I said. I'll be all right. Why, I've been all over these hills, you know that. I know, she said, but that is that was in the daytime. I never worried too much when it was daylight, but at night, that's different. It'll be dark and anything could happen. There won't be anything happen, I said. I promise, I'll be careful. Mama got up from the table saying, well, it's like I said, I can't say no and I can't help worrying. I'll pray every night you're out. The way Mama had me feeling, I didn't know whether to go hunting or not. Papa must have sensed how I felt. It's dark now, he said, and I understand those coons start stirring pretty early. You had better <coughs> be going, hadn't you? While Mama was bundling me up, Papa lit my lantern. He handed it to me, saying, I'd like to see a big coonskin on the smokehouse wall in the morning. The whole family followed me out on the porch. There we all got a surprise. My dogs were sitting on the steps, waiting for me. I heard Papa laugh. Why, they know you're going hunting, he said. Know it as well as anything. Well, I never, said Mama. Do you really think they do? It does look like they do. Why, just look at them. Little Ann started wiggling and twisting. Old Dan trotted out to the gate, stopped, turned around, and looked at me. Sure they know Billy's going hunting, piped the little one, and I know why. How do you know so much, silly? asked the oldest one. Because I told little Ann, that's why, she said, and she told old Dan, that's how they know. We all had to laugh at her. The last thing I heard as I left the house was the voice of my mother. Be careful, Billy, she said, and don't stay out late. It was a beautiful night, still and frosty. A big grinning Ozark moon had the countryside bathed in a soft yellow glow. The starlit heaven reminded me of large blue umbrella, outspread with the handle broken off. Just before I reached the timber, I called my dogs to me. Now the trail will be a little different tonight, I whispered. It won't be a hide to drag on the ground. It'll be the real thing, so remember everything I taught you and I'm depending on you. Just put one up a tree and I'll do the rest. I turned them loose saying, go get them. They streaked for the timber. By the time I had reached the river, every nerve in my body was drawn up as tight as a fiddle string. Big eyed and with ears open, I walked on, stopping now and then to listen. The way I was slipping along, anyone would have thought I was trying to slip up on a coon myself. I'd never seen a night so peaceful and still. All around me, tall sycamores gleamed like white streamers in the moonlight. A prowling skunk came wobbling up the riverbank. He stopped when he saw me. I smiled at the foxfire glow of his small, beady red eyes. He turned and disappeared in the underbrush. I heard a sharp snap and a feathery rustle in some brush close by. A small rodent started squealing in agony. A nighthawk had found his supper. Across the river and from far back in the rugged mountains, I heard the bang of a hound. I wondered if it was the same one I had heard from my window on those nights so long ago. Although my eyes were seeing the wonders of the night, my ears were ever alert, listening for the sound of my hounds telling me they had found a trail. I was expecting one of them to bawl, but when it came, it startled me. The deep tones of old Dan's voice jarred the silence around me. I dropped my axe and almost dropped my lantern. A strange feeling came over me. I took a deep breath and threw back my head to give the call of the hunter, but something went wrong. My throat felt like it had been tied in a knot. I swallowed a couple times, and the knot disappeared. As loud as I could, I whooped, Wooey! Get him, Dan! Get him! Little Ann came in. The bell-like tones of her voice made shivers run up and down my spine. I whooped to her. Wooey! Tell it, tell it to him, little girl. Tell it to him. This was what I had prayed for, worked and sweated for, my own little hounds bawling on the trail of a river coon. I don't know why I cried, but I did. While the tears rolled, I whooped again and again. They straightened the trail out and headed down the river. I took off after them as fast as I could run. A mile downstream, the coon pulled his first trick. I could tell by my dog's voices that they had lost the trail. When I came to them, they were out on an old drift, sniffing around. The coon had pulled a simple trick. He had run out on the drift, <laughs> leapt into the water, and crossed the river. To an experienced coon hound, the crude trick would have been nothing at all, but my dogs were just big, awkward pups, trailing the first live coon. I stood and watched, wondering if they would remember the training I had given them. Now and then I would whoop, or urging them on. Old Dan was having a fit. 
He whined and he bawled. He whimpered and he cried. He came to me and reared up, begging for help. I'm not going to help you, I scolded, and you're not going to find him out on that drift. If you would just remember some of the training I gave you, you would find the trail. Now go find that coon. He ran back out on the drift and started searching. Little Anne came to me. I could see the pleading in her warm gray eyes. I'm ashamed of you, little girl. I said, I thought you had more sense than this. If you let him fool you this easily, you'll never be a coon dog. She whined, turned, and trotted downstream to search again for the lost trail. I couldn't understand. Had all the training I had given them, given them been useless? I knew if I waded the river, they would follow me. Once, on the other side, it would be easy for them to find the trail. I didn't want it that way. I wanted them to figure it out by themselves. The more I thought about it, the more disgusted I became. I sat down and buried my face in my arms. Out on the drift, old Dan started whining. He made me angry, and I got up to scold him again. I couldn't understand his actions. He was running along the edge of the drift, whimpering and staring down river. I looked that way. I could see something swimming for the opposite shore. At first, I thought it was a muskrat. In the middle of the stream, where the moonlight was the brightest, I got a good look. He was little Anne. With a loud whoop, I told her how proud I was. My little girl had remembered her training. She came out on a gravel bar, shook the water from her body, and disappeared in the thick timber. Minutes later, she let me know she had found the trail. Before the tones of her voice had died away, old Dan plowed into the water. He was so eager to join her, I could hear him whining as he swam. As soon as his feet touched the bottom of the shallows, he started bawling and lunging. White sheets of water, knocked high in the moonlight by his churning feet, gleamed like thousands of tiny water stars. He came out of the river onto a sandbar. In his eagerness, he, his feet slipped into the loose sand and down he went. He came out of his roll, running and bawling. Ahead of him was a log jam. He sailed over it and disappeared down the riverbank. Seconds later, I heard his deep voice blend with the sharp cries of Little Ant. At that moment, no boy in the world could have been more proud of his dogs than I was. Never again would I doubt them. I was hurrying along, looking for a shallow riffle so I could wade across. When the voices of my dogs stopped, I waited and listened. They opened again on my side of the stream. The coon had crossed back over. I couldn't help smiling. I knew that never again would a ringtail, ringtail fool them by swimming the river. The next trick the old fellow pulled was dandy. He climbed a large water oak standing about ten feet from the river and simply disappeared. I got there in time to see my dog swimming for the opposite shore. For half an hour they worked that bank. Not finding the trail, they swam back. I stood and watched them. They practically tore the river bank to pieces looking for the trail. Old Dan knew the coon had climbed the water oak. He went back, reared up on it, and bawled a few times. There's no use in doing that, boy, I said. I know he climbed it, but he's not there now. Maybe it's like Grandpa said. He just climbed right on out through the top and disappeared in the stars. My dog didn't know it, but I was pretty well convinced that that was what the coon had done. They wouldn't give up. Once again, they crossed over to the other shore. It was no use. The coon hadn't touched the bank. They came back. Old Dan went up the river, and Little Ann worked downstream. An hour and a half later, they gave up and came to me begging for help. I knelt down between their wet bodies. While I scratched and petted them, I let them know I still loved them. I'm not mad, I said. I know you did your best. If that coon can fool, us, fool both of us, then we're just beat. We'll go someplace else to hunt. He's not the only coon in these bottoms. Just as I picked up my axe and lantern, little Ann let out a ball and tore out down the riverbank. Old Dan, with a bewildered look on his face, stood for a moment looking after her. Then, raising his head high in the air, he made an eardrum's ring with his deep voice. I could hear the underbrush popping as he ran to join her. I couldn't figure out what had taken place. Surely little Ann had heard or seen something. I could tell by their voices that whatever it was they were after, they were close enough to see it and were probably running by sight. The animal left the bottoms and headed for the mountains. Whatever it was, it must have realized my dogs were crowding it too closely. At the edge of the foothills, it turned and came back toward the river. I was still trying to figure out what was going on when I realized that on striking the river, the animal had again turned and was coming straight toward me. I set my lantern down and tightened my grip on the axe. I was standing my ground quite well when visions of bears, lions, and all kinds of other animals started flashing across my mind. I jumped behind a big sycamore and was trying, to hard, trying hard to press my body into the tree when a big coon came tearing by. Twenty-five yards behind him came my dogs, running side by side. I saw them clearly when they passed me, bawling every time their feet touched the ground. After seeing that, there was nothing to be scared of. Once again, I was the fearless hunter, screaming and yelling as loud as I could. Get him, boy, get him. I tore out after him. The trails I knew so well were forgotten. I took off straight through the brush. I was tearing my way through some elders when the voices of my dogs stopped. Holding my breath, I stood still and waited. Then it came, the long, drawn-out ball of the tree bark. My little hounds had done it. They had treed the first coon. When I came to them and saw what they had done, I was speechless. I groaned and closed my eyes. I didn't want to believe it. There were a lot of big sycamores in the bottoms, but the one in which my dogs had treed was the giant of them all. While prowling the woods, I had seen the big tree many times. I had always stopped and admired it. 
Like a king in its own domain, it towered far above the smaller trees. It had taken me quite a while to find a name suitable for the big sycamore. For a while I called it the chicken tree. In some ways it had reminded me of a mother hen hovering over her young in a rainstorm. Its huge limbs spread out over the small birch, ash, box elder, and water oak as if it were alone <coughs> were their protector. Next, I named it the giant. That name didn't last long. Mama told his children about a big giant that lived in the mountains and eight little children that were lost. Right away, I started looking for another name. One day, while lying in the warm sun staring at its magnificent beauty, I found the perfect name. From that day on, it was called the big tree. I named the bottoms around it the big tree bottoms. Walking around it and using the moon as a light, I started looking for the coon. High up in the top, I saw a hollow in the end of a broken limb. I figured that was the coon's den. I could climb almost any tree I had ever seen, but I knew I could never climb the big sycamore, and it would take days to chop it down. There had been very little hope from the beginning, but on seeing the hollow, I gave up. Come on, I said to my dogs, there's nothing I can do. We'll go someplace and find another coon. I turned to walk away. My hounds made no move to follow. They started whining. Old Dan reared up, placed his front paws on the trunk, and started bawling. I know he's there, I said, but there's nothing I can do. I can't climb it. Why, it's 60 feet up to the first limb, and it would take me a month to cut it down. Again, I turned and started on my way. Little Ann came to me. She reared up and started licking my hands. Swallowing the knot to my throat, I said, I'm sorry, little girl. I want him just as badly as you do, but there's no way I can get him. She ran back to the tree and started digging in the soft ground close to the roots. Come on now, I said in a gruff voice. You're both acting silly. You know I can't get to I'd get the coon for you if I could, but I can't. With a whipped dog look on her face and with her tail between her legs, little Ann came over. She wouldn't even look at me. Old Dan walked slowly behind the tree and hid himself. He peeped around the big trunk and looked at me. The message I read in his friendly eyes tore at my heart. He seemed to be saying, you told us to put one in a tree and you would do the rest. With tears in my eyes, I looked again at the big sycamore. A wave of anger came over me. Gritting my teeth, I said, I don't care how big you are, I'm not going to let my dogs down. I told them if they put a coon in a tree, I would do the rest, and I'm going to. I'm going to cut you down. I don't care if it takes me a whole year. I walked over and sank my axe as deep as I could in the smooth white bark. My dogs threw a fit. Little Ann started running in circles. I could hear her ple pleased, whimpering cry. Old Dan bawled and started gnawing on the big tree's trunk. At first it was easy. My axe was sharp and the chips flew. Two hours later, things were different. My arms felt like two dead grapevines, and my back felt like someone had pulled the plug out of one end of it and drained all the sap out. While taking a breather, I saw I was making more progress than I thought I would. The cut I had started was a foot deep, but I still had a long way to go. Sitting on their rears, my dogs waited and watched. I smiled at the look on their faces. Every time I stopped chopping, they would come over. While little Ann washed the sweat from my face, old Dan would inspect my work. He seemed to be pleased with what he saw, for he always wagged his tail. Along about daylight, I got my second wind, and I really did make the chips fly. This burst of energy cost me dearly. By sunup, I was so stiff I could hardly move. My hands and arms were numb. My back screamed with pain. I could go no further. Sitting down, I leaned back against the big tree and fell asleep. Little Ann woke me up by washing my face. I groaned with the torture of getting to my feet. Every muscle in my body seemed to be tied in a knot. I was thinking of going down to the river to wash my face in the cool water when I heard a loud whoop. I recognized my father's voice. I whooped to let him know where I was. Papa was riding our red mule. After he rode up, he just sat there and looked me over. He glanced at my dogs and at the big sycamore. I saw the worry leave his face. He straightened his shoulders, pursed his lips, and blew out a little air. He reminded me of someone who had just dropped a heavy load. In a slow, calm voice, he asked, Are you all right, Billy? Yes, Papa, I said. Oh, I'm a little tired and sleepy. Otherwise, I'm fine. He slid from the mule's back and came over. Your mother's worried, he said. When you didn't come in, we didn't know what had happened. You should have come home. I didn't know what to say. I bowed my head and looked at the ground. I was trying to choke back the tears when I felt his hand on my shoulder. I'm not scolding, he said. We just thought maybe you had an accident or something. I looked up and saw a smile on his face. He turned and looked at the tree. Say, he said, this is the sycamore you call the big tree, isn't it? I nodded my head. Is there a coon in it, he asked. There sure is, Papa, I said. He's in that hollow limb. See, that one way up there? That's why I couldn't come home. I was afraid to get away. Maybe you just think he's there, Papa said. I believe I'd make sure before I cut down a tree that big. Oh, he's there all right, I said. My dogs weren't ten feet behind him when, they went, when he went up it. Why are you so determined to get this coon, Papa asked. Couldn't you go somewhere else and tree one? Maybe the tree would be a smaller one. I thought about that, Papa, I said. But I made a bargain with my dogs. I told them that if they would put one in a tree, I'd do the rest. Well, they fulfilled their part of the bargain. 
Now it's up to me to do my part, and I'm going to, Papa. I'm going to cut it down. I don't care if it takes me a year. Papa laughed and said, Oh, I don't think it'll take that long, but it will take a while. I, I tell you what I'll do. You take the mule and go get some breakfast. I'll chop on it till you get back. No, Papa, I said. I don't want any help. I want to cut it down all my, by myself. You see, if someone helps me, I wouldn't feel like I kept my part of the agreement. An astonished look came over my father's face. Why, Billy, he said, you can't stay down here without anything to eat and no sleep. Besides, it'll take at least two days to cut that, that tree down, and that's hard work. Please, Papa, I begged, don't make me quit. I just have to get that coon. If I don't, my, pop, my dogs won't ever believe in me again. Papa didn't know what to tell me. He scratched his head, looked over to my dogs, and back at me. He started walking around. I waited for him to make up his mind. He finally reached a decision. Well, all right, he said. If that's the way you want it, I'm for, for it, even if it only as an agreement between you and your dogs. If a man's word isn't any good, he's no good himself. Now I have to get back and tell your mother that you're all right. It's a cinch that you can't do that kind of work on an empty stomach. So I'll send your oldest sister down to the lunch bucket. With tears in my eyes, I said, Tell Mama I'm sorry for not coming home last night. Don't worry about your mother, he said as he climbed on the mule's back. I'll take care of her. Another thing, I have to make a trip to the store today, and I'll talk this over with your grandfather. He may be able to help some way. After Papa left, things were a little different. The tree didn't look as big, and my axe wasn't as heavy. I even managed to sing a little as I chopped away. When my sister came with the lunch bucket, I could have kissed her, but I didn't. She looked one look at the big tree, and her blue eyes got as big as a guinea pig, guinea's egg. You're crazy, she gasped. Absolutely crazy. Why, it'll take a month to cut that tree down, and all for an old coon. I was so busy with the fresh side pork, fried eggs, and hot biscuits, I didn't pay much attention to her. After all, she was a girl, and girls don't like don't think like boys do. She raved on, you can't possibly cut it down today, and what are you going to do when it gets dark? I'm going to keep right on chopping, I said. I stayed with it last night, didn't I? Well, I'll stay till it's cut down. I don't care how long it takes. My sister got upset. She looked at me, threw back her small head, and looked up to the top of the sycamore. You're as crazy as a bed bug, she said. Well, I never heard of such a thing. She stepped over in front of me and very seriously asked if she could look in my eyes. Look in my eyes, I said. What do you want to do that for? I'm not sick. Yes, you are, Billy, she said. Very sick. Mama said when old man Johnson went crazy, his eyes turned green. I want to see if yours have. This was too much. If you don't get out of here, I shouted, you're going to be red instead of green. And I mean that. I grabbed up a stick and started towards her. Of course I wouldn't have hit her for anything. This scared her and she started for the house. I heard her saying something about an old coon as she disappeared in the underbrush. Down in the bottom of my lunch bucket I found a neat little package of scraps for my dogs. While they were eating I walked down to a spring and filled the bucket with cool water. The food did wonders for me. My strength came back. I spit on my hands and whistling a coon hunter's too and I started making the chips fly. I cut The cut grew so big I could have laid down in it. I moved over to the other side and started a new one. Once while I was taking a rest, old Dan came over to inspect my work. He hopped up in the cut and sniffed around. You'd better get out of there, I said. If that tree takes a notion to fall, it'll sm smash you flatter than a tadpole's tail. With no care, look on his friendly face. He gave me a hurry-up signal with a wag of his tail. Little Ann had dug a bed in a pile of dead leaves. She looked as if she were asleep, but I knew she wasn't. Every time I stopped swinging the axe, she would raise her head and look at me. Chapter 9 by late evening, the happy tune I had been whistling was forgotten. My back throbbed like a stone bruise. The muscles in my legs and arms started quivering and jerking. I couldn't gulp enough air to cool the burning heat to my lungs. My strength was gone. I could go no further. I sat down and called my dogs to me. With tears in my eyes, I told them that I just couldn't cut the big tree down. I was trying hard to make them understand when I heard someone coming. It was Grandpa in his buggy. I'm sure no one in the world can understand a young boy like his grandfather can. He drove up with a twinkle in his eyes and a smile on his whiskery old face. Hello, how are you getting along, he boomed. Not so good, Grandpa, I said. I don't think I can cut it down. It's just too big. I guess I'll have to give up. Give up, Grandpa barked. Now I don't want to hear you say that. No, sir, that's the last thing I want to, want to hear. Don't ever start anything you can't finish. I don't want to give up, Grandpa, I said. But it's just too big, and my strength's gone. I'm give out. Of course you are, he said. You've been going at it wrong. To do work like that, a fellow needs plenty of rest and food in his stomach. 
How am I going to get that, Grandpa? I asked. I can't leave the tree. If I do, the coon will get away. No, he won't, Grandpa said. That's what I came down here for. I'll show you how to keep that coon in the tree. He walked around the big sycamore, looking up. He whistled again. Boy, this is a big this is a big one, all right. Yes, it is, Grandpa. I said, it's the biggest one in the river bottoms. Grandpa started chuckling. That's all right, he said. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. How are you going to make the coon stay in the tree, Grandpa? I asked. With a proud look on his face, he said, that's another one of my coon hunting tricks. Learned it when I was a boy. We'll keep him there all night. Oh, I don't mean we can keep him there for always, but he'll stay for four or five days, that is, until he gets so hungry he just has to come down. I don't need that much time, I said. I'm pretty sure I can have it down by tomorrow night. Grandpa looked at the cut. I don't know, he said. Even though it's halfway down, you must remember you've been cutting on it half of one night in one day. You might make it, but it's going to take a lot of chopping. If I get a good night's sleep, I said, and a couple of meals under my belt, I can do a lot of chopping. Grandpa laughed. Speaking of meals, he said, your ma is having chicken and dumplings for supper. Now, we don't want to miss that, so let's get busy. What do you want me to do, Grandpa? I asked. Well, let's see, he said. First thing we'll need is some sticks about five feet long. Take your axe, go over in that cane break, and get us six of them. I hurried to do what Grandpa wanted, all the time wondering what in the world he was going to do. How could he keep the coon in the tree? When I came back, he was taking some old clothes from the buggy. Take this stocking cap, he said. Fill it about half full of grass and leaves. While I was doing this, Grandpa walked over and started looking up in the tree. You're pretty sure he's in that hollow limb, aren't you? He asked. He's there, all right, Grandpa, I said. There's no other place he could be. I've looked all over it. And there's no other hollow anywhere. Well, in that case, Grandpa said, we better put our man al along about here. What man, Grandpa? I asked in surprise. The one we're going to make, he said. To us, it'll be a scarecrow, crow, but to the coon, it'll be a man. Knowing too well how smart coons were, right away I began to lose confidence. I don't see how anything like that can keep a coon in a tree, I said. It'll keep him there all right, Grandpa said. Like I told you before, they're curious little devils. He'll poke his head out of that hole, see this man standing here, and he won't dare come out. It'll take him four or five days to figure out that it isn't a real honest-to-goodness man. By that time, it'll be too late. He'll have his hide tacked on the smokehouse wall. The more I thought about it, the more I believed it. And then there was that serious look on Grandpa's face. That was all it took. I was firmly convinced. I started laughing. The more I thought about it, the funnier it got. Great big laughing tears rolled down my cheek. What's so funny, Grandpa asked. Don't you believe it'll work? Sure it'll work, Grandpa. I said, I know it will. I was just thinking, those current coons aren't as half as smart as they think they are, are they? We both had a good laugh at this. With the sticks and some bailing wire, Grandpa made a frame that looked almost like a gingerbread man. On this, he put an old pair of pants and a red sweater. He stu we stuffed the loosely flabby clothes with grass and leaves. He wired in the stocking cap head in place and stepped back to inspect his work. Well, what do you think of it? He asked. If it had a face, I said, you couldn't tell if it tell it from a real man. We can fix that, Grandpa chuckled. He took a stick and dug some black grease from one of the hubcaps on the buggy. I stood and watched watched while he applied his artistic touch in the stocking cap head. He made two mean-looking eyes, a crooked nose, and the ugliest mouth I'd ever seen. Well, what do you think of that? He asked. Looks pretty good, huh? Laughing fit to kill and talking all that at the same time, I told him that I wouldn't blame the coon if he stayed in the tree until Gabriel blew his horn. He won't stay that long, Grandpa chuckled, but he'll stay long enough for you to cut that tree down. That's all I want, I said. We'd better get going, Grandpa said. It's getting late, and we don't want to miss that supper. I was so stiff and sore, he had to help me to the buggy seat. I called to my dogs. Little Ann came, but not willingly. Old Dan refused to leave the tree. Come on, boy, I coaxed. Let's go home and eat, so get something to eat. We'll come back tomorrow. He bowed his head and looked the other way. Come on, I scolded. We can't sit here all night. This hurt his feelings. We walked around behind the sycamore and hid. Well, I'll be darned, Grandpa said as he jumped down from the buggy. He knows that coon's there, and he doesn't want to leave it. You've got a coon hound there, and I mean a good one. He picked, up, he picked old Dan up in his arms and set him in the buggy. All the way home, I had to hold on to his collar to keep him from jumping out and going back to the tree. As our buggy wound its way up through the bottoms, Grandpa started talking. You know, Billy, he said, about this tree top chopping of yours. I think it's all right. In fact, I think it would be a good thing if all young boys had to cut down a big tree like that once in their life. It does something for them. It gives them determination and willpower. That's a good thing for a man to have. It goes a long way in his life. The American people have a lot of it. They have proved that all down through history, but they could do with <coughs> with a lot more of it. I couldn't see this determination and willpower that Grandpa was talking about very clearly. All I could see was a big sycamore tree, a lot of chopping, and the hide of a ringtail coon that I was determined to have. As we reached the house, Mama came out. Right away, she started checking me over. Are you all right? She asked. Sure, Mama, I said. What makes you think something's wrong with me? 
Well, I didn't know, she said, the way you acted when you got down from the buggy. I thought maybe you were hurt. Ah, uh, he's just a little sore and stiff from all that chopping, Grandpa said, but he'll be all right. That'll soon go away. After Mama saw that there was no broken bones or legs chopped off, she smiled and said, I never know anymore. I guess I'll just have to get used to it. Papa hollered from the porch. Come on in. We've been waiting supper on you. We were having chicken and dumplings, Mama beamed, and I cooked them especially for you. During the meal, I told Grandpa I didn't think that the coon in the big tree was the same one my dogs had been trailing at first. What makes you think that? He asked. I told how the coon had fooled us and how little Ann had seen or heard this other coon. I figured he had just walked up on my dogs before he realized it. A smile spread all over Grandpa's face. Chuckling, he said, It does look that way, but it wasn't. No, Billy, it was the same coon. They're much too smart to ever walk up on a hound like that. He pulled a trick, and it was a good one. In fact, it'll fool nine out of ten dogs. Well, what did he do, Grandpa? I asked. I'm pretty sure he didn't cross the river. So how did he work it? Grandpa pushed the dishes back, and using his fork as a pencil, he drew an imaginary line on the tablecloth. It's called the backtracking trick, he said. Here's how he worked it. He climbed that water oak, but he only went up about 15 or 20 feet. He then turned around and came down in the same tracks. He backtracked on his original trail for a way. When he heard your dogs coming, he leapt far up on the side of the nearest tree and climbed up. He was in that tree all the time your dogs were searching for the lost trail. After everything had quieted down, he figured that they had given up. That's when he came down, and that's when little Ann either heard or saw him. Pointing the fork at me, Grandpa said very seriously, you mark my word, Billy, in no time at all. That little Ann will know every trick a coon can pull. You know, Grandpa, I said, she wouldn't bark treed at the, at the water oak like old Dan did. Of course she wouldn't, he said. She knew he wasn't there. Why, I never heard of such a thing, Mama said. I had no idea coons were that smart. Why, for all anyone knows, he may not be in the big tree at all. Maybe he pulled another trick. It'd be a shame if Billy cut it down and found there was no coon in it. Oh, he's there, Mama, I hastily replied. I know he is. They were right on his tail when he went up. Besides, little Ann was bawling her head off when I came to them. Of course he's there, Grandpa said. They were crowding him too closely. He didn't have time to pull another trick. Grandpa left soon after supper, saying to me, I'll be back down in a few days, and I want to see that coon hide. I thanked him for helping me and walked out to the buggy with him. Oh, I almost forgot, he said. I heard there was a fad back in New England states. Seems like everyone is going crazy over coonskin coats. Now, if this is true, I'll look for the price of coon hides to take a jump. I was happy to hear this and told my father what Grandpa had said. Papa laughed and said, Well, if you can keep the coons out of those big sycamores, you might make a little money. Before I went to bed, Mama made me take a hot bath. Then she rubbed me all over with some liniment that burned like fire and smelled like a civet cat. It seemed like I had barely closed my eyes when Mama woke me up. Breakfast is about ready, Billy, she said. I was so stiff and sore I had trouble putting my clothes on. Mama helped me. Maybe you'd better let that coon go, she said. I don't think he's worth all of this. I can't do that, Mama, I said. I've gone too far now. Papa came in from the barn. What's the matter, he asked. You a little stiff? A little stiff, Mama explained. He couldn't, could hardly put his clothes on. Ah, oh, he'll be all right, Papa said. If I know anything about swinging an axe, it won't be long before he's as limber as a rag. Mama just shook her head and started putting out our breakfast on the table. While we were eating, Papa said, You know, I woke up several times last night, and each time I was sure I heard a hound bawling. It sounded like old Dan. I quit the table on the run and headed for the doghouse. I didn't have to go all the way. Little Ann met me on the porch. I asked her where old Dan was and called his name. He was nowhere around. Little Ann started acting strangely. She whined and started stared down or stared toward the river bottom. She ran out to the gate, came back and reared up on me. Mama and Papa came out on the porch. He's not here, I said, and I think he's gone back to the tree. I don't think he'd do that, would he? Mama said. Maybe he's around someplace. Have you looked in the doghouse? I ran and looked. He wasn't there. Everybody be quiet and listen, I said. I walked out beyond the gate a little ways and whooped as loud as I could. My voice rang like a bell in the still, frosty morning. Before the echo had died away, the deep ooh of old Down's old Dan rolled out of the river bottoms. He's there, I said. He wanted to make sure the coon stayed in the tree. You see, Mama, why well, I have to get that coon? I can't let him down. Well, I never in all my life, she said. I had no idea a dog loved to hunt that much. Yes, Billy, I can see now, and I want to, you to get him. I don't care if you have to cut down every tree in those bottoms. I want you to get that coon for those dogs. I'm going to get him, Mama, I said, and I'm going to get him today if I possibly can. Papa laughed and said, looks like there wasn't any use in building that scarecrow. All you had to do was tell old Dan to stay and watch the tree. I left the house in a run. Now and then I would stop and whoop. Each time I was answered by the deep voice of old Dan. Little Ann ran ahead of me. By the time I reached the big tree, their voices were making the bottoms ring. 
When I came tearing out of the underbrush, old Dan threw a fit. He tried to climb the sycamore. He would back way off, then bawling and running as fast as he could, he would claw his way far up on its side. Little Ann, not to be outdone, reared up and placed her small front paws on the smooth white bark. She told the ringtail coon that she knew he was there. After they had quieted down, I called old Dan to, to me. I'm proud of you, boy. I said, it takes a good dog to stay with the tree all night. But there wasn't any need in you coming back. The coon wouldn't have gotten away. That's why we built the scarecrow. Little Ann came over and started rolling in the leaves. The way I was feeling toward her, I couldn't even smile at her playful mood. Of course you feel good, I said in an irritated voice, and it's no wonder. You had a good night's sleep in a nice warm doghouse. But old Dan didn't. He was down here in the cold all by himself, watching the tree. The way you're acting, I don't believe you care if Coon gets away or not. I would have said more, but just then I noticed something. I walked over for a better look. There, scratched deep in the soft leaves, were two little beds. One was smaller than the other. Looking at little Ann, I read the answer in her warm gray eyes. Old Dan hadn't been alone when he had gone back to the tree. She, too, had gone along. There was no doubt that in the early morning she had come home to get me.